This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Vein by Chrétien de Troy, translated by W. W. Comfort. Section 8. After the Mass, my Lord Yvain heard bad news, when he thought the time had come for him to leave, and that nothing would stand in his way. But it could not be in accordance with his wish. When he said, Sire, if it be your will, and with your permission, I am going now, the master of the house replied, Friend, I will not grant your permission yet. There is a reason why I cannot do so, for there is established in this castle a very terrible practice, which I am bound to observe. I shall now cause to approach two great, strong fellows of mine, against whom, whether right or wrong, you must take arms. If you can defend yourself against them, and conquer and slay them both, my daughter desires you as her lord, and all the suzerainty of this town and all its dependencies await you. Sire, said he, for all this I have no desire, so may God never bestow your daughter upon me, but may she remain with you for she is so fair and so elegant that the emperor of germany would be fortunate to win her as his wife no more fair guest the lord replied there is no need of my listening to your refusal for you cannot escape he who can defeat the two who are about to attack you must by right receive my castle and all my land and my daughter as his wife there is no way of avoiding or renouncing the battle but I feel sure that your refusal of my daughter is due to cowardice, for you think that in this manner you can completely avoid the battle. Know, however, without fail, that you must surely fight. No knight who lodges here can possibly escape. This is a settled custom and statute, which will endure yet for many a year, for my daughter will never be married until I see them dead or defeated. Then I must fight them in spite of myself, but I assure you that I should very gladly give it up. In spite of my reluctance, however, I shall accept the battle, since it is inevitable. Thereupon, the two hideous black sons of the devil come in, both armed with a crooked club of the cornelian cherry tree, which they had covered with copper and wound with brass. They were armed from the shoulders to the knees, but their head and face were bare, as well as their brawny legs. Thus armed, they advanced, bearing in their hands round shields, stout and light for fighting. The lion begins to quiver as soon as he sees them, for he sees the arms they have, and perceives that they come to fight his master. He is aroused, and bristles up at once, and, trembling with rage and bold impulse, he thrashes the earth with his tail, desiring to rescue his master before they kill him. And when they see him, they say, Vassal, remove the lion from here, that he may not do us harm. Either surrender to us at once, or else, we adjure you, that lion must be put where he can take no part in aiding you or in harming us. You must come alone to enjoy our sport, for the lion would gladly help you, if he could. My lord Yvain then replies to them, Take him away yourselves if you are afraid of him for I shall be well pleased and satisfied if he can contrive to injure you, and I shall be grateful for his aid. They answer, Upon my word, that will not do. You shall never receive any help from him. Do the best you can alone, without the help of any one. You must fight single-handed against us too. If you were not alone, it would be two against two. So you must follow our orders, and remove your lion from here at once however much you may dislike to do so. Where do you wish him to be? he asks. Or where do you wish me to put him? Then they show him a small room and say, Shut him up in there. It shall be done, since it is your will. Then he takes him and shuts him up. And now they bring him arms for his body, and lead out his horse, which they give to him, and he mounts. The two champions, being now assured about the lion, which is shut up in the room, come at him to injure him and do him harm. They give him such blows with the maces that his shield and helmet are of little use, for when they hit him on the helmet, they batter it in and break it, 
and the shield is broken and dissolved like ice, for they make such holes in it that one could thrust his fist through it. Their onslaught is truly terrible. And he, what does he do against these two devils? Urged on by shame and fear, he defends himself with all his strength. He strains every nerve, and exerts himself to deal heavy and telling blows. They lost nothing by his gifts, for he returned their attention with double measure. In his room, the lion's heart is heavy and sad, for he remembers the kind deed done for him by this noble man, who now must stand in great need of his service and aid. If now he could escape from there, he would return him the kindness with full measure and full bushel, without any discount whatsoever. He looks about in all directions, but sees no way of escape. He hears the blows of the dangerous and desperate fight, and in his grief he rages and is beside himself. He investigates until he comes to the threshold, which was beginning to grow rotten, and he scratches at it until he can squeeze himself in as far as his haunches, when he sticks fast. Meanwhile, my lord Yvain was hard-pressed and sweating freely, for he found that the two fellows were very strong, fierce, and persistent. He had received many a blow, and repaid it as best he could, but without doing them any harm, for they were well skilled in fencing, and their shields were not of a kind to be hacked by any sword, however sharp and well-tempered it might be. So my lord Yvain had good reason to fear his death, yet he managed to hold his own until the lion extricated himself by continued scratching beneath the threshold. If the rascals are not killed now, surely they will never be, for so long as the lion knows them to be alive, they can never obtain truce or peace with him. He seizes one of them and pulls him down to earth like a tree trunk. The wretches are terrified, and there is not a man present who does not rejoice. For he whom the lion has dragged down will never be able to rise again unless the other succors him. He runs up to bring him aid, and at the same time to protect himself, lest the lion should attack him as soon as he had dispatched the one whom he had thrown down. He was more afraid of the lion than of his master. But my lord Yvain will be foolish now if he allows him longer life, when he sees him turn his back and sees his neck bare and exposed. This chance turned out well for him. When the rascal exposed to him his bare head and neck, he dealt him such a blow that he smote his head from his shoulders so quietly that the fellow never knew a word about it. Then he dismounts, wishing to help and save the other one from the lion, who holds him fast. But it is of no use, for already he is in such straits that a physician can never arrive in time. For the lion, coming at him furiously, so wounded him at the first attack that he was in a dreadful state. Nevertheless, he drags the lion back, and sees that he has torn his shoulder from its place. He is in no fear of the fellow now, for his club has fallen from his hand, and he lies like a dead man, without action or movement. Still, he has enough strength to speak, and he said as clearly as he could, Please take your lion away, fair sire, that he may not do me further harm. Henceforth you may do with me whatever may be your desire. Whoever begs and prays for mercy ought not to have his prayer refused, unless he addresses a heartless man. I will no longer defend myself, nor will I ever get up from here with my own strength, so I put myself in your hands. Speak out, then, he says, if thou dost admit that thou art conquered and defeated. Sire, he says, it is evident I am defeated in spite of myself, and I surrender, I promise you then thou needest have no further fear of me, and my lion will leave thee alone. Then he is surrounded by all the crowd, who arrive on the scene in haste, and both the lord and his lady rejoice over him, and embrace him, and speak to him of their daughter, saying, Now you will be the lord and master of us all, and our daughter will be your wife, for we bestow her upon you as your spouse. And for my part, he says, I restore her to you. Let him who has her keep her. I have no concern with her, though I say it not in disparagement. Take it not amiss if I do not accept her, for I cannot and must not do so. 
but deliver to me now, if you will, the wretched maidens in your possession. The agreement, as you well know, is that they shall all go free. What you say is true, he says, and I resign and deliver them freely to you. There will be no dispute on that score, but you will be wise to take my daughter with all my wealth, for she is fair and charming and sensible. You will never find again such a rich marriage as this. Sire, he replies, you do not know of my engagements in my affairs, and I do not dare to explain them to you. But you may be sure, when I refuse what would never be refused by any one who was free to devote his heart and intentions to such a fair and charming girl, that I too would willingly accept her hand if I could, or if I were free to accept her or any other maid. But I assure you that I cannot do it, so let me depart in peace, for the damsel who escorted me hither is awaiting me. She has kept me company, and I would not willingly desert her, whatever the future may have in store. You wish to go, fair sire? But how? My gate will never be open for you, unless my judgment bids me give the command. Rather shall you remain here as my prisoner. You are acting haughtily, and making a mistake when you disdain to take my daughter at my request. Disdain, my lord? Upon my soul, I do not disdain her. Whatever the penalty may be, I cannot marry a wife or tarry here. I shall follow the damsel who is my guide, for otherwise it cannot be. But, with your consent, I will pledge you my right hand, and you may take my word, that, just as you see me now, I will return if possible, and then will accept your daughter's hand, whenever it may seem good to you. Confound any one, he says, who asks you for your word or promise or pledge. If my daughter pleases you, you will return quickly enough. You will not return any sooner, I think, for having given your word or sworn an oath. Be gone now. I release you from all oaths and promises. If you are detained by rain or wind, or by nothing at all, it is of no consequence to me. I do not hold my daughter so cheap as to bestow her upon you forcibly. Now go about your business, for it is quite the same to me whether you go or whether you stay. Thereupon my lord Yvain turns away, and delays no longer in the castle. He escorted the poor and ill-clad wretches, who were now released from captivity, and whom the lord committed to his care. These maidens feel that now they are rich, as they file out in pairs before him from the castle. I do not believe that they would rejoice so much as they do now, were he who created the whole world to descend to earth from heaven. Now all those people who had insulted him in every possible way come to beseech him for mercy and peace and escort him on his way. He replies that he knows nothing of what they mean. I do not understand what you mean, he says, but I have nothing against you. I do not remember that you ever said anything that harmed me. They are very glad for what they hear, and loudly praise his courtesy, and after escorting him a long distance, they all commend him to God. Then the damsels, after asking his permission, separated from him. When they left him, they all bowed to him, and prayed and expressed the wish that God might grant him joy and health, and the accomplishment of his desire wherever in the future he should go. Then he, who is anxious to be gone, says that he hopes God will save them all. Go, he says, and may God conduct you into your country safe and happy. Then they continue their way joyfully, and my lord Yvain departs in the other direction. All the days of that week he never ceases to hurry on under the escort of the maid, who is well acquainted with the road and with the retired place where she had left the unhappy and disconsolate damsel who had been deprived of her inheritance. But when she heard news of the arrival of the maiden and of the knight with the lion, there never was such joy as she felt within her heart. For now she thinks that, if she insists, her sister will cede her a part of her inheritance. The damsel has long lain sick and had just recovered from her malady. It had seriously affected her, as was apparent from her face. Straight away she went forth to meet them, greeting them and honoring them in every way she could. There is no need to speak of the happiness that prevailed that night in the house. 
no mention will be made of it, for the story would be too long to tell. I pass over all that, until they mounted next morning and went away. They rode until they saw the town where King Arthur had been staying for a fortnight or more, and there, too, was the damsel who had deprived her sister of her heritage, for she had kept close to the court, waiting for the arrival of her sister, who now draws near. But she does not worry much, for she does not think that her sister can find any knight that can withstand my lord Gawain's attack, and only one day of the forty yet remains. If this single day had passed, she would have had the reasonable and legal right to claim the heritage for herself alone, but more stands in the way than she thinks or believes. That night they spent outside the town, in a small and humble house, where, in accordance with their desire, they were not recognized. At the first sign of dawn the next morning, they necessarily issue forth, but ensconce themselves in hiding until broad daylight. I know not how many days had passed since my lord Gawain had so completely disappeared that no one at court knew anything about him, except only the damsel in whose cause he was to fight. He had concealed himself three or four leagues from the court, and when he returned, he was so equipped that even those who knew him perfectly could not recognize him by the arms he bore. The damsel, whose injustice towards her sister was evident, presented him at court in the sight of all, for she intended with his help to triumph in the dispute where she had no rights. So she said to the king, My lord, time passes. The noon hour will soon be gone, and this is the last day. As you see, I am prepared to defend my claim. If my sister were going to return, there would be nothing to do but await her arrival. But I may praise God that she is not coming back again. It is evident that she cannot better her affairs, and that her trouble has been for naught. For my part, I have been ready all the time up to this last day to prove my claim to what is mine. I have proved my point entirely without a fight, and now I may rightfully go to accept my heritage in peace, for I shall render no accounting for it to my sister as long as I live, and she will lead a wretched and miserable existence. Then the king, who well knew that the damsel was disloyally unjust towards her sister, said to her, My dear, upon my word, in a royal court, one must wait as long as the king's justice sits and deliberates upon the verdict. It is not yet time to pack up, for it is my belief that your sister will yet arrive in time. Before the king had finished, he saw the knight with the lion and the damsel with him. They too were advancing alone, having slipped away from the lion, who had stayed where they spent the night. The king saw the damsel, who he did not fail to recognize, and he was greatly pleased and delighted to see her, for he was on her side of the quarrel, because he had regard for what was right. Joyfully he cried out to her as soon as he could, Come forward, fair one, may God save you. When the other sister hears these words, she turns trembling, and sees her, with the knight whom she had brought to defend in her claim. Then she turns blacker than the earth. The damsel, after being kindly welcomed by all, went to where the king was sitting. When she had come before him, she spoke to him thus, God save the king and his household. If my rights in this dispute can be settled by a champion, then it will be done by this knight who has followed me hither. This frank and courteous knight had many other things to do elsewhere, but he felt such pity for me that he cast aside all his other affairs for the sake of mine. Now, madam, my very dear sister, whom I love as much as my own heart, would do the right and courteous thing if she would let me have so much of what is mine by right that there might be peace between me and her, for I ask nothing that is hers. Nor do I ask for anything that is thine, the other replied, for thou hast nothing, and nothing shalt thou have. Thou canst never talk so much as to gain anything by thy words. Thou mayest dry up with grief. Then the other, who was very polite and sensible and courteous, replied with the words, Certainly I am sorry that two such gentlemen as these should fight on our behalf over so small a disagreement. 
but I cannot disregard my claim, for I am in too great need of it. So I should be much obliged to you if you would give me what is rightly mine. Surely, the other said, anyone would be a fool to consider thy demands. May I burn an evil fire and flame if I give thee anything to ease thy life. The banks of the Seine will meet, and the hour of prime will be called noon, before I refuse to carry out the fight. May God and the right, which I have in this cause, and in which I trust, and have trusted till the present time, aid him, who in charity and courtesy has offered himself in my service, though he knows not who I am, and though we are ignorant of each other's identity. So they talked until their conversation ceased, and then produce the knights in the middle of the court. Then all the people crowd about, as people are wont to do, when they wish to witness blows in battle or in joust. But those who were about to fight did not recognize each other, though their relations were wont to be very affectionate. Then do they not love each other now? I would answer you both yes and no, and I shall prove that each answer is correct. In truth, my lord Gawain loves Yvain, and regards him as his companion, and so does Yvain regard him, wherever he may be. Even here, if he knew who he was, he would make much of him, and either one of them would lay down his head for the other, before he would allow any harm to come to him. Is not that a perfect and lofty love? Yes, surely. But, on the other hand, is not their hate equally manifest? Yes, for it is a certain thing that doubtless each would be glad to have broken the other's head, and so to have injured him as to cause him humiliation. Upon my word, it is a wondrous thing that love and mortal hate should dwell together. God, how can two things so opposed find lodging in the same dwelling place? It seems to me they cannot live together, for one could not dwell with the other, without giving rise to noise and contention, as soon as each knew of the other's presence. But upon the ground floor there may be several apartments, for there are halls and sleeping rooms. It may be the same in this case. I think love has ensconced himself in some hidden room, while hate has betaken herself to the balconies looking on the high road, because she wishes to be seen. Just now hate is in the saddle, and spurs and pricks forward as she can, to get ahead of love, who is indisposed to move. Ah, love, what has become of thee? Come out now, and thou shalt see what a host has been brought up and opposed to thee by the enemies of thy friends. The enemies are these very men who love each other with such a holy love. For love, which is neither false nor feigned, is a precious and a holy thing. In this case, love is completely blind, and hate, too, is deprived of sight. For if love had recognized these two men, he must have forbidden each to attack the other, or to do anything to cause him harm. In this respect, then, love is blind and discomforted and beguiled, for, though he sees them, he fails to recognize those who rightly belong to him. And though hate is unable to tell why one of them should hate the other, Yet she tries to engage them wrongfully, so that each hates the other mortally. You know, of course, that he cannot be said to love a man who would wish to harm him and see him dead. How, then? Does Yvain wish to kill his friend, my lord Gawain? Yes, and the desire is mutual. Would, then, my lord Gawain desire to kill Yvain with his own hands, or do even worse than I have said? Nay, not really. I swear and protest. One would not wish to injure or harm the other, in return for all that God has done for the man, or for all the empire of Rome. But this, in turn, is a lie of mine, for it is plainly to be seen that, with lance raised high in rest, each is ready to attack the other, and there will be no restraint of the desire of each to wound the other, with intent to injure him and work him woe. Now tell me, when one will have defeated the other, of whom can he complain who has the worst of it? For if they go so far as to come to blows, I am very much afraid that they will continue the battle and the strife until victory be definitely decided. 
if he is defeated, will Yvain be justified in saying that he has been harmed and wronged by a man who counts him among his friends, and who has never mentioned him but by the name of friend or companion? Or, if it comes about perchance that Yvain should hurt him in turn, or defeat him in any way, will Gawain have the right to complain? Nay, for he will not know whose fault it is. In the ignorance of each other's identity, they both drew off and took their distance. At this first shock, their lances break, though they were stout and made of ash. Not a word do they exchange, for if they had stopped to converse, their meeting would have been different. In that case, no blow would have been dealt with lance or sword. They would have kissed and embraced each other, rather than sought each other's harm. For now they attack each other with injurious intent. The condition of the swords is not improved, nor that of the helmets and shields, which are dented and split, and the edges of the swords are nicked and dulled, for they strike each other violently, not with the flat of the swords, but with the edge, and they deal such blows with the pommels upon the nose-guards and upon the neck, forehead, and cheeks, that they are all marked black and blue, where the blood collects beneath the skin. And their halberts are so torn, and their shields so broken in pieces, that neither one escaped without wounds. Their breath is almost exhausted with the labor of the strife. They hammer away at each other so lustily, that every hyacinth and emerald set in their helmets is crushed and smashed. For they give each other such a battering with their pommels upon the helmets that they are quite stunned, as they almost beat out each other's brains. The eyes in their heads gleam like sparks as, with stout square fists and strong nerves and hard bones, they strike each other upon the mouth as long as they can grip their swords which are of great service to them in dealing their heavy blows. When they had for a long time strained themselves, until the helmets were crushed, and the halberts' meshes were torn apart with the hammering of the swords, and the shields were split and cracked, they drew apart a little, to give their pulse a rest, and to catch their breath again. However, they do not long delay, but run at each other again more fiercely than before, and all declare that they never saw two more courageous knights. This fight between them is no jest, but they are in grim earnest. They will never be repaid for their merits and deserts. The two friends, in their bitter struggle, heard these words, and heard how the people were talking of reconciling the two sisters. But they had no success in placating the elder one, and the younger one said she would leave it to the king, and would not gainsay him in anything. But the elder one was so obstinate that even the queen Guinevere and the knights and the king and the ladies and the townspeople sighed with the younger sister, and all joined in beseeching the king to give her a third or a fourth part of the land in spite of the elder sister, and to separate the two knights who had displayed such bravery, for it would be too bad if one should injure the other or deprive him of any honour and the king replied that he would take no hand in making peace, for the elder sister is so cruel that she has no desire for it. All these words were heard by the two, who were attacking each other so bitterly that all were astonished thereat, for the battle is waged so evenly that it is impossible to judge which has the better and which the worse. Even the two men themselves who fight and who are purchasing honour with agony are filled with amazement, and stand aghast, for they are so well matched in their attack, that each wonders who it can be that withstands him with such bravery. They fight so long that the day draws on to night, while their arms grow weary, and their bodies sore, and the hot, boiling blood flows from many a spot, and trickles down beneath their halberts. They are in such distress that it is no wonder if they wish to rest. They both withdraw to rest themselves, each thinking within himself that, however long he has had to wait, he now at last has met his match. For some time they thus seek repose, without daring to resume the fight. They feel no further desire to fight, because of the night which is growing dark, and because of the respect they feel for each other's might. These two considerations keep them apart, and urge them to keep the peace. 
but before they leave the field, they will discover each other's identity, and joy and mercy will be established between them. End of section 8